Hello there everyone, I'm Mr. Moklover and thank you for joining me here in Tia Nova, the last series of Europe in which we're playing as the People's Revolutionary Council. So, if you'd like to read about the country's info, please go right ahead as I scroll down. Now, I'm not sure how many people have actually played as the People's Revolutionary Council, but here we are. And I did want to try them out as, at the time of this recording, I'm starting to run out of different Russian unifiers. Now, there's different paths for quite a few different unifiers, but... I don't think a lot of love has been given to this nation, but let's begin with the Eastern Conflict. The People's Revolutionary Council has established itself and has a fair amount of control over the western fringes of Mongolia. However, we wish we could say the same for the rest of the nation, as come under the yoke of Mengjiang, nothing more than the proxies for the Japanese imperialists and their Chinese lapdogs. In spite of that, not all hope is lost, and light can be seen at the end of the tunnel under the leadership of Yum Zhajin and Tseden Bal. The Mongolians have risen up once again to drive their oppressors out of their rightful lands. They might be facing Menjiang and therefore the entire co-prosperity sphere, but the hope of liberation never fades away. These times are equally important for the council as well. We must seek to find what our approach will be, and whether we will come to the res rescue of the revolutionaries, or remain alone in a struggle for survival. In the National Spirit's legacy, the Siberian flag, pretty cool, far from home of course. We have directional disputes, which is very bad. We have Red Army in Exile, which is good and bad at the same time. And we have democratic military, not bad, not terrible, not great. And army-civilian relationship. But do you want a cigarette? The soldier asked his new friends in the platoon. My name is Vasily. These are quite rare. We smuggle them in from Mongolia. You would be surprised at the comforts the Japanese enjoyed in Ulaanbaatar. The young, youngest man, barely over 20 years old, quickly took one, followed by another soldier. All three eagerly sat down in the tent as Vasily carefully lighted the cigarettes with an impro improvised lighter seemingly from the Soviet era. He tried to start a discussion. In the council's army, there was one question that guaranteed interesting and diverse answers. Where do you come from? After exhaling a large cloud of smoke, the youngest man began speaking in broken Russian. My name is Nergui, and I'm actually here from Mongolia. Somebody's voice was heard from the back. Now that's rare, Nergui continued to anyway. Joining the army was the first time I went anywhere outside my village. My parents both died fighting the Japanese when I was just quite young. But a woman brought me to the safety of the Red Army, which I feel obligated to join years later. It was, turn of the oldest, it was the turn of the oldest officer to speak. Have you heard of the tale of the 226th Battalion? As the Nazi army swept through the Eastern Europe, encircling and crushing entire divisions, the 226th was caught unprepared somewhere in the plains of Belarus. We were encircled, yet hundreds escaped across the German lines, retreating eastwards and pledging to never look back. That is exactly what we did, much like in the Great War. I was a commander of that battalion, and here I am. Vasily opened, and as so social as always, took the freedom to speak for himself. I am from the city of Omsk, as you can imagine. The unit I was in got called in to defend Mongolian, and you know the rest. I'm just eager to return to my home, and there's little we can do to other than fight for our way there. They may find unity in their differences, but fortify the border. The frontier between the council and the autonomous territory of Minjiang, while in legal terms non-existent, is in fact defined by a series of checkpoints, roads, and natural landmarks running across western Mongolia. What well, is clearly not the optimal area for an army to go through, we do not know to what extent Minjiang will go if they assert their control over Mongolia once again. Thus, we must use this window of opportunity. We are not threatened by the Japanese puppets on the frontier to fortify it. Using knowledge from the great wars of the Soviet Union and the skirmishes we have had with the rival Mongolian government, we can start installing defensive installations to protect us. Small forts, hideouts, and where the troops can't be seen, and other similar constructions we've built. Should Minjiang push further and threaten our existence as a whole, we must be prepared in aid of Mongolia? The Presidium has received an urgent request for aid on behalf of the nascent Mongolian People's Republic, self-declared, as Minjianese troops move into the borderlands. The Republic, at this stage, more of a guerrilla movement, is almost certainly doomed to defeat if the other socialist powers do not intervene, and few and far between are those still friendly to the Red Banner in this portion of Russia. Debate over the precise form of aid to be sent to the Mongolian PR remains unclear, however. Our already stretched military resources cannot long afford to respond to a foreign conflict, even if it will prove a distraction to our struggle or strategic rival in that region. In addition, army generals are deadlocked as the precise form of aid we should send to them. The Mongolians favor a direct movement of troops, armed as a as light and armament load we can provide to the Mongolians to harden their battle readiness. The catch is, of course, is that these men will consist entirely of Mongolian battalions operating independently of the Red Army. Vasilevsky's Red Army generals propose a shipment of weapons instead. They argue that the weapons will do little good in the hands of poorly trained Mongolians. A direct transfusion would be more helpful to the war effort in the long run, of course. A sizable detachment of the Presidium supports total inaction, which, as a debate continues, is looking like an increasingly attractive option. Well, we don't want them to die. I, I, I want to send them volunteers, send arms. Uh, do we have any equipment for us? We don't have anything, so... Send men? I do not want to send men. I'd rather send arms. Yeah. Send our regards. Yeah, we can do that one too. And over here... Oh, crap. What is this? 
the modern Bulgatir, if you want to put that, please your head. The remnants of the Red Army that settled with us in Mongolia are fierce and tenacious, but they are also sorely unequipped, and what weapons they do have are increasingly obsolete. We must take action to modernize and improve these forces if we are to secure victory in the future. Monthly change, 1%. Do we want more infantry or more infantry attack or armor defense? So, or armor attack. So here, this could be a rare campaign. This is one of the reasons why I want to play these guys as well. It's because they actually have helicopters. They start off with helicopter divisions, which is amazing. So I don't want to use armor in this campaign, really. I want to use helicopters. Armor speed. I want to maximize infantry, attack, and defense. Trading time. Organization. Yeah, organization regain. Yeah, that's probably pretty good. Political struggle. Click on the states for further inter interaction. Armor power is 80%. Loyalty. Army loyalty is decayed. And civilian loyalty is decayed by each one each month. Okay, that's different. Decay is dependent on the number of states controlled by the state versus our total number of states. Because of our army relationships, we're gaining speed bonus, conscription bonus, army morale. Because of our civilian relationships, we're gaining more political, political power daily, which we get one every day. Additional capacity bonus and agricultural societal development. Wow. Um, I think for this one, I want to do civilian stuff. I want to do a lot of civilian stuff, so. Internal factionalism. Uh, ooh, the Russians and the Mongols, which has which other factions more power will decide which path the People's Revolutionary Council will take. And we can do that one, but we're not dealing with that. There we go. That one too. There you go. Cool. Legacy. Oh, we have the, oh my god, we have Legacy of the Siberian Plan too. We have so much need to spend our PP. Working discontent is low. No one cares about the workers, so. And then prepare the men. The threat of war begins to loom over the People's Revolutionary Council, and everyone can sense it. In the streets of Kizil and Ulaistai, the calm before the storm is apparent. That's a pretty fun mod, too. People prepare for the wars, and so should the army. As it stands now, the military is a formidable force, almost reminiscent of the glory days of the far eastern military district. However, if it is a stand-up against a Japanese-backed army, something more will be needed to ensure that we have the upper hand in the possibility of an all-out war. Mobilization must begin. Drawing from what little manpower the desolate Mongolian steppes have to, uh, to offer us, more men must be recruited and trained. The last thing we should want is to enter a great nation-deciding conflict, only to be overwhelmed by an unexpected advantage. I get 500 more manpower back. Nice. All right. So what can we do here? Let's see. Um, worker concessions. Oh, it's all about the stuff down here. Yeah, no thanks. Um, Kemerovo or these guys? Well, both these guys are probably not super weak. Uh, let's see. Two to four divisions, not bad. Oh, our helicopters aren't really that great either. Crest, no yards. We don't have the command bar technically. I'd rather raid these guys. These guys are probably actually pretty. Yeah, that's that's a lot of divisions. That's a lot of divisions. Not gonna lie. That is a buttload of divisions. Oh well, they've been raided. Okay then. We could do against those guys, but I don't feel really confident about that. Six divisions versus six divisions. The only infantry and our guys aren't really that great either. We've got these guys, eight combat width. We've got these guys who are 12 combat width. We've got cavalry, which is six combat width. And so just because we have a lot of divisions doesn't mean anything really. So, yeah. Ooh. I want to do this quite a, quite a bit too. Worker discontent doesn't mean anything. All right, we'll see what happens then. Preparing the men. Favor the Russians. I'm not really sure every man possible. It seems like I'll have to play the station twice, so give more rights. Equal rights? Oh, we lose political power, though. An elite army? Yeah, I'll probably go combat schooling, so. Favor the Russians for this campaign. So remind me, when we get to the next campaign, we'll do favor the Mongolians, but we'll see what happens. Equipment? Yes, please. And over here, could we do anything? Oh, yeah, we can, but oh, how about over here? Oh, my goodness. Pursue favors from the civilian administrators. Greatly increase loyalty, slightly increase civilian power. Is there any way that we can increase... Civilian loyalty every month. Oh, now it's decaying by zero percent. Look at that. Greatly decrease civilian loyalty. Increase power. Um, loyalty. Well, loyalty right now is not great. Uh, just do that one then. Fine. So be it. Oh, we have so much of a need for PP. But favor the Russians. Ever since the foundation of the People's Revolutionary Council, the people at its helm became clear, and they were all Russian officers. The Mongolian authorities were slowly sidelined, seeing as how they could not offer much and were incompetent or even corrupt. Despite the calls for equality and respect of the Mongolians, which we have already granted to a great extent, the experienced Red Army officers from the days of the Great Patriotic War must continue to lead the state as long as it is still in danger. We should also not forget that there is a sizable Russian population in Tuva, comparable to the sparse settlements of Mongolians in their lands. They should be given benefits so as to earn their trust in the council. I really want to beat him up, though. I really want to beat him up. Oh, I am. I'm feeling. I'm feeling very violent right now. At the time of this recording, I'm feeling very violent, and we're about to make an attack. So, path of peace. If you were a soldier, perhaps Jambin Bakmunk would be more hardened to, more willing to tolerate the realities of conflict. 
As it was, he could barely stop himself from sweeping at what he saw. Here he was, in this cherished native Uth's province, yet this was not the one he remembered. He remembered it being a land of relative plenty, with a bright future and tough but happy people. Now were there people starving, amputees struggling to get by, and most of all, a seemingly universal feeling of hopelessness. Had the war really changed so much? If this is what it was like here, where there had been a little drug conflict, he shuddered to think of what it must be like in the areas the Japanese and the collaborators had actually occupied. Even with that said, however, he wondered if there was really no peaceful solution to the trouble Mongolia faced. Even if they had helped bring chaos to Mongolia, Mongolia. Surely it was possible to talk things out with other factions. They were all Mongols, after all. Heirs of a great legacy and destined for a bright future. He just wished someone, anyone, would be want a peaceful solution. As always, his thoughts were unvoiced and unheard. Perhaps peace was just a pipe dream, but... Uh, academic base is going down, research facilities stagnant, agriculture is slowly going up, poverty is getting worse, and this equipment is not doing anything. Expertise is going up quite a bit. I mean, professionalism and nuclear stockpile is not doing too much, so... Uh, uh, is there a... Yep, let's go. Do it. Come on, pay up. No! Alright, well, they're there, so favor the Russians, and then we're going to do Legacy of the Siberian War. The Siberian War was a tragedy for all sides involved. The Central Siberian Republic and the Agoda's government endlessly clashed, and the result was nothing more than many deaths and the collapse of both states. The People's Revolutionary Council remained out of this bloody affair, but did not look away from the front lines, in fact. We must keep a close eye on the conflict, and aside from ensuring that we never were threatened by either side, we learned many lessons from it. One of the most important ones was that of the military tactics. You go to soldiers fought using the tactics of the Old Red Army, and so did the CSR for the most part. This can be particularly useful as we find ourselves on the verge of war once again. Our generals must closely examine the battles of the Siberian War and the strategies used, so that when time comes to fight, we have a better chance. Nice, come on. Get that militia division in there as fast as possible. I want to win, win quickly. Wait, win, 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 win. And I, do, I want to do this so badly, but we have to deal with this stuff too, so which kind of sucks, honestly. Okay, so now it's 60% loyalty and 32%... Ooh, 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 that's not good. Ooh, that was not really good to do. Um, we want more loyalty and more power. Oh, they, they showed up. Not bad. Army, weaken... Civilian power, weaken these guys. I don't want to weaken them. For glory once more. Al Aldarkhan was a beautiful land, tough of animals. Full of tough animals and tougher people. As Batian Doors was finding out, though, even the toughest of peoples had their limits. The number of people he had been seen begging for food, money, and anything else while touring out Al Darkan was unbelievable. His homeland was no longer recognizable to him, and it was all the fault of those darn Japanese. It was the Japanese who had killed his people with the help of those traitors' collaborators. It was the Japanese who stole their resources for their own profit, and it was the Japanese who had torn his country apart, pitting brother against brother one day. They get to what was coming to them. His fellow Mongols deserve much more. For today, however, he would continue to observe and let his rage build. When the time came, he would destroy the invaders without a second thought. Revenge had to be exacted. Even if that revenge necessitated further suffering, mercy was never an option. Never, ever an option. Why do we decrease loyalty in exchange for power? Huh. Well, whatever. Hopefully there's focuses about that stuff. Um, okay, 5% more. Oh, we can lower this by using... Wait, what does that mean? Is So, we get minus 5% and we get a more army XP, maybe? Huh. We lose 20 command power. Okay, so now armor attack goes down. That's a little bit better, actually. That should help us out in this battle. The weapons check. Oh, crap, this is not good. This is really not turning good now. Oh, that's really, really bad. But we did beat one of them up. Don, Kaisel, Red Army Central HQ. The Armaments Department is renowned as the most hardworking department in the People's Revolutionary Council. But in reality, it is simply the most busy. Comprehensive weapons inspections are a part of the daily life as the entirety of the spectrum of the Red Army's logistics flows through the doors. And for every model that enters the report, it's expected within the proverbial week. The end of the Mongolian Civil War, as they're calling it, has not made the department's job much easier. Battle reports, casualty ratios, operational incidents, and weapon reviews from the company level and up must be integrated into the consistently shifting matrix of already complex detailing. The result is that recommendations from the armament department can quite literally change with the wind in the case of unexpected results from one of the more exposed test sites. As the horizon begins to glow with approaching light, an unnamed clerk in the department watches smoke grow thick and stingy or stringy in the air. The report is he is printing is hefty and necessarily so. The cover page comes out from the last labored foot. Photocopier labeled Analysis of the General Infantry Equipment and Doctrine, a review. The general staff passed the finished report around, wincing at its size. But those who do read it are now with quite relief. Their substantial investment in the Red Army's infantry force equipment has not gone to waste, it appears. Even so, the recommendation section summons a considerable enthusiasm in its proposals for increased investment, which would, as a matter of pure coincidence, benefit the general staff's personally divested interests in the arms industry. Increase the budget, keep it level, and increase the budget. Oh, this sucks. Oh, man. This really sucks. Yeah, I don't think we're going to win. God dang it. This sucks. Really? Come on, guys. Just kill them off. Please, just kill them off. 
All right, an elite army? Yeah. And quest to form a proper army, one that can be truly facing a formidable enemy. Quality can be often be better than quantity. It's better to have the world's greatest army of just a few thousand troops than to have a massive horde, badly equipped and badly trained, to achieve this in the council. We can reduce the amount of men we recruit in return for ensuring that every man of them can offer the most in the battlefield. The man shall be carefully selected, being fit and able to fight effectively. They shall at all times be armed with the best guns and equipment we have to offer, and they will be trained carefully until they are ready to enter the war. The High Command hopes that this way we will no longer be a disorganized force, but an elite one that will be able to stand up to any enemy. Oh, that sucks. How much manpower and equipment do you have? I have a lot of divisions. They're out of manpower, so any damage we do, they can't replace. And eh, kind of the same thing with us, but still. We're led by a guy with two. Eh. Eh, this stuff is okay. Uh, I'd rather have infantry equipment, or infantry expert. You're slowly getting there, but let's go and do this stuff, too. We can work on manpower. Um, I want a Siberian plan. Russian faction is dominant for now. That's fine. And down here. I don't know how long these last. This modifier, or this little thing, as well as a political uh, struggle right now. We will lose that, but... The Cleese of civilian power and stuff... That should boost us up a little bit more in time, right? God dang it, we're going to lose this one. God dang it, I hate... Oh, what is that? You're at Sissonry? Oh. There you go. Military? Oh, I didn't know that. Cool, that's cool, actually. I hate that we're going to lose this one. Come on, that's so stupid. That is incredibly stupid. A memorable border encounter. Always vigilant for potential NKVD infiltrators. The border guards of the People's Revolutionary Council themselves long-serving Red Army men. Quickly spotted the party... Small party approaching the direction of Irkutsk. Quickly moving to detain the party, the quick soldiers quickly found <clears throat> themselves quite astonished at the stormy story communicated to them. First, a broken and strangely accented Russian from the man, then, with more expertise from the woman, investigating further. Their astonishment only grew as the man's travel documents were inspected by the group's luggage searched. Eventually, accepting the story given and listening with an amusement at the reception the man and woman spoke of by the authorities in Irkutsk, the guards permitted them to enter into the PRC, directing them towards Organ. They also informed them right before sending a radio message that if they were not observed there in short order, the consequences could be severe indeed. As the party disappeared over the horizon and along, along the road, the soldiers completed their patrol, returning to the barracks shortly thereafter. That evening, over army stew and cards, they spoke with wonders at, wonder at just what could have been could possess an American to go trekking all across all of Russia, and what the odds of his survival were. The sergeant won, giving him no better than one chance in ten. But still a chance. God dang it, I can't believe we're going to fail, fail this one. Uh, just, you know what, I'm going to kill these guys off. It's, that's so, that's that's BS. That's complete BS. Come on. Our soldiers suck. They're god-awful soldiers. I should have not attacked them, but Jesus Christ. Yeah, I'm going to kill these people. I'm going to broach every single one of these anarchists in the end. But, entry nine. The People's Revolutionary Council. After the most unpleasant experience with the Soviet authorities in the lands around Irkutsk, we continued southwards, entering the lands of the People's Revolutionary Council. Apparently, a state created in Mongolian lands by Red Army remnants is capital, such as it could be called, had all the character of a military camp. And just about the equivalent friendliness of one, we spent some time securing small trinkets and stories from the local citizenry, but beyond that, there is, sadly, little of note to write about. One thing it did offer, however, was the opportunity to dispatch a letter back to America. For a very reasonable fee, a trader who will soon cross through the Mainjiang and towards the port in Darin agreed to carry some mail. I hope it is received reasonably soon. Compared to my interactions with the locals, the experiences I shared with Zoya in these lands were far more interesting. She is a most remarkable woman, capable of easily inserting herself into the cultures of the states we, that we visit, and navigating complex internal cultures of the states that we visit. And, oh wait, my apologies, I just read that one. And navigating complex internal politics, which seemingly, with seemingly a little effort. She is also, as I've discovered several times now, excellent at sensing dangerous situations and working to either avoid them completely or defuse them before they turn violent. I am again thankful for that at Secure Services. We are proceeding onwards, intending to cross the internal demarcation line between the Far East and Central Siberia. I am curious to see what this state exists, or what states exist. We have already seen such a variance in government here, and I wonder if this experience will continue. I hope it does. A valued companion. And actually, it wasn't all for a loss, even though we did lose, and I almost never lose these, but I do lose these like, on occasion. We got 36 army XP. That's not bad. Even though this one, we did get probably 10-ish, realistically. So that's not terrible. So, emergency military industry. As many across the world know, industry is always the backbone of a nation and a military force. Without it, there are no guns for the troops to carry into battle, nor tanks to use, nor planes to fly above the battlefield. It would be optimal for our army to enjoy dozens of industrial complexes fully dedicated to supporting it. But in the environment we are in, it's not plausible in a short amount of time. If we want to integrate the factories into the war effort in time to defend our lands, then the only option is to steal from the civilian sector. What few factories we have at our disposal will have to urgently be renovated and converted in order to serve the council. Machine parts will be switched out, assembly lines replaced or twisted, all for the good of the country. And we're going to keep getting that stuff. 
Yeah, actually, for this gun, um, I always do when I play the Warlord Strategic Theorem Doctrine. But I'm going to go and combine operations this time just because I want to get a boost to our air assault. So, that'd be nice. Wheels within wheels within wheels. Another day, another military briefing, another game of chess. Ivanov and Fyodor are locked in the Tango of Strategic strategy debates and once the chessboard sits in witness and judgment. Another night and an another maneuver. The board clicked with a sound of varnish wood. All right, I'll swerve to the right. I must admit that this is a gambit I've never tried before. One thing I must thank you for, Ivanov. I'll swerve with a hand on the other side of the board. I'm here to click, deliberate in its slowness. No need to thank me, Fyodor. Thank me when you find something that works. Now pay attention. I've left my center undefended. Now the castling is broken. How would you exploit this? Well, obviously. With a swerve to pin your active rook and lock down my center pawns in mobile warfare like the Germans try. If I can get my bishop here in time, I have an avenue down to the king. You are a fool. Well, perhaps not even that. Even the rankest fool can understand that the attack would have come from the right itself to immobilize this open row before my queen could break out. Ah, uh, you and your combined operations, Claptrap. In this case, swiftness, not strategy, is what is required, and I might add that it is showing promise in the wide-open strategic environment of the Seps. Truly, the Academy has taught you nothing. These wide-open environments speak nothing of the promise of mobile infantry thrusts, but to the success of combined arm pushes. If you pay attention to the Academy and not skirt-chasing advanced module, perhaps you would have understood that. Yeah, we were talking about this. We were literally just talking about this. Yeah, nice. So, we, as much as I love maneuver warfare... Actually, I almost never choose maneuver warfare. We'll go with combined operations. Great. We can't do this one. Actually, partial mobilization would have been really good to go to, but whatever. Improve our weapons. An army always needs the best weapons possible if they want to fight a war effectively. Unfortunately for us, unless we clash with the warlord states to our north, we will have to face the extremely modernized armies of the co-prosperity sphere. This has made most officers in our military consider the expansion, and most importantly, the modernization of our weapon arsenals important. Using a combination of leftover depo depots, old Soviet designs, and new Japanese ones, we can make an effort to change, make changes to the guns we produce. We must focus on making beneficial tweaks, but tweaks that do not affect the resources required to produce them, or hopefully even reduce them. That way, our minor armaments industry will be more effective in its aim. Hmm. They return socials here, huh? Simeon Rozhsevinsky. Man, I don't speak Russian at all. Man, I feel so bad about losing that battle. But we still get more than one political power every single day. And actually, how is the... Well, let's do this one first. That's fine. Let's take out... Oh, we can do both. Okay. Let's do that one first just because the other one lose, makes us lose political power, which I don't want to lose, so... Mobilize the economy. The economy of the People's Revolutionary Council quite... While quite small in size, it is just the same as that of the any socialist power in practice. We've based it on that of the old Soviet Union, despite its many differences that are now a result of our dire situation. Now war is on the horizon, and in this economy we'll need to be properly prepared to support the council by whatever means. What is needed is for our general mobilization of the economy to begin. As Ming Jiang comes closer and closer to launching their inevitable attack against us, the country needs to be set on a war footing. More funds will be put into the military production, while war measures like rations will slowly be introduced. If this goes well, then we'll be ready for whatever comes next. Great, we lose political power though. We do get some more military factory construction speed though, which is nice as well. Hopefully we can scavenge soon, because I want people to attack us. Screw this, I want people to attack us now. Um, more attack and defense. Let's grab more defense this time. I love the armor speed, but let's get more defense. I don't want to hurt that at all. I love that we can use command power for this instead of, um, other stuff, so. <sighs> Minus 5%. Do we really get... I want to try this. Minus 5%. We do get... Holy crap. Why do you get more army XP for that, then? Huh. Plus 5%. Minus 5%. Um. I want more air assault attack. Organization regain. You know what? I'll leave this up to you guys. Should we get more organization regain or should we get more division training time? I'll leave that up to you, so. Yeah. We'll see what happens. Maybe we won't have enough time for it, but we'll see what happens. Oh. And now it's 74%. That's not too bad. Cool. Greatly increase civilian loyalty. That wouldn't be too bad. We have no stability, but whatever. I really want to do the civilian plan, too, but. Uh. Extraction. Um, it's consumer good, right? We want as much consumer goods as possible, which I don't think we could do that one yet. Uh, stability goes down. I will do it once. I will do it once at least first. And we do have one loot, so people can raid us if they want to. But last preparations. If we're to truly wage war against our largest enemy, we cannot simply in send our army as it stands into Western Mongolia and expect them to win. Extensive preparations must be made and plans drafted in anticipation of an all-out attack. More men will be called to serve in the Red Army of the Far East, and slowly mobilization will begin. Aside from manpower, the economy is equally or perhaps even more important. Production must be exponentially increased, for an army cannot function without the necessary equipment. If this preparation is carried out quickly and effectively, then we shall head into the war with a real hope of victory and get more war support along the way. Look at that. Only minus 20% stability? Not bad. More organization is going to be super important, though. As we have a coffee, but a return of arms. 
Dawn settles over the plains like a whisper. The sky, untainted by a cloud, grows faintly on the shimmering edges like a plate metal he heated to a boiling point. Morning is coming to you, Mongolia. The company stands watch over the small town awaits its orders in the morning. Even here, far beyond the front line, there is work to be done. The village's water wells must be cleaned. The market check for suspicious items. The home of old Bilgun check for what appears to be some kind of infestation. Always there is work and with a purpose. Names are being read in the rudimentary barracks. Patrols deployed. Bill billets issued. Men and women occasional w men and the occasional women laugh and joke in the manner of all young people sharing tea and treats with the children who run up to them. There's no harm in sharing, especially since combat rations would be intolerable in any other circumstance. The children at least are enamored and adorable. Old Bilgun watches the patient Red Army guardsmen as they take apart the old celery he always had trouble with, and for the first time he wonders if they will stay after the great struggle they speak of is concluded. It is not, not an occupation after all, if you truly do belong. Officer Androvich is busy studying the village's walls and when the order comes, his face stiffens, and then is busy barking orders to his com command team. For the next day or so, the company moves into the frenzied life, packing, repurposing, and giving away what cannot be carried. By the, end, by the time Don... Yeah, my apologies. By the time Dawn touches next Mongolia, the company's gone. War is over. That's unfortunate. But there's nothing we could really do there. I don't, I don't think we could have sent divisions. We can almost never send divisions without some sort of special uh, mechanic, so. Yeah, we're still trying to build up a city. It is what it is. Come on, people, try to raid us. Hopefully, they're still out of manpower and they get raided all the time. Yep, they're still out. Good. My apologies about that. But that was my water bottle. I drink a lot of water. I drink a lot of water, so. Alright, so we're back here. Um, division train. I'll leave that for you guys. Army XP gain is really not that bad. I actually really like it. But more at air attack. Yeah. 5% more. Because their guys are looking really bad after that last battle. Actually, it's not looking terrible. I could actually look a lot, lot worse. Just need more divisions. Uh, yeah, marshal. Field Marshal. Got a good. Oh, actually, do you have an upgrade? Yeah, you do have an upgrade. Okay, that's nice. Oh, just I'm going to go for that one. And or aggressive assault is really good as well. But last preparations, and then we shall strike them. Oh, war comes to the council. When the Union collapsed, we fled here. This wretched corner of Mongolia, devoid of anything worth having, became our home. We reorganized our shattered divisions, made repairs as best we could to the infrastructure that had not fallen prey to banditry or bullet or bomb, but built homes and lives of our own in the shadow of turmoil to the north and east. It was not much, but what else could we do? In the same vein, it was also inevitable that the Meijing Republic and their Japanese backers would turn their envious eyes towards the last corner of old Mongolia not yet under the yoke of the Japanese left dogs. The entirety of our defensive planning is centered on this central belief that one day, Kalgan would come for our peace of the steppe, and yet it proved insufficient. As the bullets fly anew across the border with Meijing, so painstakingly secured, Mongolian divisions have already begun advancing across it in what appears to be an attempt to remove us altogether. The Red Army awaits them, and the total sum of our military industry behind it. If we must find our end here, we shall live and die free. Oh, oh, they go to war with us. Holy crap, I was not expecting that. Well, I guess it kind of was, but at the same time, like, wow. Um, can we at least get this one done? Uh, why's not? Well, that's not good. Oh, wait, what? Okay, so that auto goes. First strike. In the principal Mongolian city of Ulban Batar, the flag of the revolutionaries has been torn down, replaced by the flag of the traitorous inner Mongolians that obey every order of Nanjing and Tokyo. In the far eastern border of the People's Revolutionary Council, thousands of people arrived from troops they had rebelled to innocent civilians seeking to flee Mong Jiang's rule. Seb Dembao's rebellion has been defeated, and the rebels have been captured or forced to humiliating retreat. As our enemy reestablishes their control, it is only logical to assume that we are the next targets. Thus, we must make the first move to catch them by surprise and increase our chances as much as possible. The Soviet army of the Far East will be the first one to begin the assault. Well, too late for that. Well prepared to strike and combat any resistance offered by the enemy, and is only now cleared the area of the Mongolian people's front. We can only hope this goes well. With increased war propaganda efforts. Uh, we need more guns immediately. Guns from the last from the Great Patriotic War. During the Great Patriotic War, Bukhara and Soviet Union amassed a large army to fight the Germans, while in the end, it was not enough to achieve victory. Its scattered remains and their equipment survived in some places, and the same thing happened in the lands that the Council occupies. Tuva and Mongolia saw the deployment of Red Army troops as Vasilsky's proud units raced to take control of them before Japan did. While this was obviously not entirely successful, these areas are still filled with old depots containing arms and ammo. These resources, long forgotten, must be brought back into the light and be used by our armies as they must use everything at their disposal for the good of the council. That's my apologies. I am completely unprepared for this. I didn't think they'd attack this fast, but the apocalypse, the people's apocalypse. Um, alright. Uh, if you want to read about this, please go ahead. I think this is the book that always happens, so there you go. A hunting tale. God dang it, we lose political power. Why? Go, 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 go. Go to Moron. 
War Councilism, the men of the 14th Re People's Revolutionary Squadron, sat around the campfire full of a distinct aura as the men tried to ignore the spaces where their fallen comrades usually sat. Gone were the days of laughter and brotherhood. They had all lost someone, a friend, a mentor. Now, I know casualties are always hard, said Dimitri the officer, a more brazen young man than the usual among the Red Army, but losses always happen. It's part of war. <clears throat> Nikita, the more aged veteran of the patriotic war, stood up, shouting, This time it was preventable. You're the one who gives the orders, and you're the one who's responsible for almost getting us encircled. We could have all died back then. My orders, growled Dmitri, were to hold your ground and fight. You cowards were the ones who ran into that ambush. Even worse, yelled Nikita. If we had stayed, we would have been surrounded by an enemy five times our size. Face it, Dmitri. You're not made to be an officer. It's time we left a new one. Field replacement is a core tenant of the council, after all. Dmitri sighed, Fine, if you want a new officer, replace me. None of you know how to lead a dog, much less a squad of 50 men. I'll be sure to remember when this this when I die of stupidity. 15-1 for Nikita, welcome to the officer's court, and you know what, because we were not prepared, I'm going to go back and make sure that we're a little bit more prepared for this war. Alright everyone, so I basically went back to the autosave at the beginning of the month, and we were soldiers over, and as you can see, we've already made one heck of an encirclement, which is pretty good already. Um, actually, you guys, uh, yeah, go over there. Basically, the only way we're going to win this war is if we encircle these guys. They have seven divisions, we have six, our guys are not looking super strong, but a, oh, they're attacking us as well. That cavalry division will die, which is super, super, super important. But we'll see what happens. We'll definitely see what happens. Hope and the helicopters are incredibly important for this type of uh, strategy. So, moving fast and encircling them is just basically the game. As long as they can't go down there, we'll be okay. Uh, you guys, go there, go there. Move, 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 move. Kill them all quickly, 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 quickly. Oh, we got one of them dead. Nice. And we just finish up the gun stuff, which is awesome. Red shells? Yes, please. Since its inception, artillery has proven itself to be one of the most effective weapons to use in the combat. Even in the First World War, its use became universal. Before an attack to overwhelm enemy divisions and defenses, an intense and unforgiving barrage of artillery strikes on the enemy lines can be enough to disorganize and demoralize them. These tactics have continued all the way to our era, and they can still be useful in battle. As a nation of war, it's only logical we seek to find all artillery we have at our disposal, produce it, and integrate it into our army. The factories, busy as they are, constantly putting out equipment, will now have the additional task of producing shells of fire and cannons to bombard with. Nice. And anything else here? Um, not yet. We still have a little bit of command power, which actually I'm going to go and increase this general's stuff. And we'll go... Ooh, actually let's go logistics, just because it's going to be really bad around here. So that should help save us a few supplies. Help them out. Actually, don't even go in there. Just do that. Help support the attack there. There you go. Good. And you guys did a great job. Awesome, 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 awesome. Oh, they actually have Japanese tanks. Oh. Do we beat them up? Do we beat Jap... Cool! Help them out, kill them off, come on, come on, come on, before the Japanese get in here, come on, kill them, kill them, kill them, before we get in circle ourselves, move, move, for the love of God, move, oh, there goes Guiana, cool, um, it's alright, uh, anything else here yet, agricultural methods, there we go, cool, my god, you guys take so, way too long, you guys seriously take way too long, um, they're not really attacking us there, so which is fine, they, their IFEs look really bad, oh, I'm glad we got there too, nice, and they're gone, good, 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 uh, I guess the Japanese, we're not fighting the Japanese, which is good. Okay, that's good. Japanese are not really here yet. I wonder if we can just, just take everything they have before the Japanese can do anything. A bridge too f Oh. A bridge too far. Night covers the steps from burning Kalagan to the hustle of Kaizil. The bickering party Presidium is still in session, trying desperate to themselves to work out the logistics of a defensive war that has outgrown its alliance supply and strategic scope. They squabble over what to do with the swaths of territory the Red Army has been foisted upon. Without any form of administrative structure to control it, it is endless and exhausting in its intensity. In outside, it is a quiet night, as the military transports to the front lines have halted under the threat of approaching sandstorms. Kaizil itself turns on in a buzz of nascent industry and commerce work, and the Tuvan people now under snow-capped mountains in between their silver rivers slumber and work through the night as they have done for centuries. It is a beautiful moonlit clear, as an untouched pool in a mountain cave. There is nothing obstructing the bomb sites far overhead. The flight of the Mitsubishi manufactured heavy bombers makes it as far as the city center before they are ripped apart by anti-aircraft defenses, but it is far, far too late for hundreds of workers and households, and the party presidium itself is nearly destroyed by shrapnel. What is more distressing still is the wreckage of the bomber squad. The insignia of the rising sun is bold and visible to all sifting through the ruins. The pretense, the pretense of non-interference has been dropped. Prepare the ceasefire terms. Um, can we just make a rush? Let's make a rush for everything here. Screw it. Let's go! Oh, they're attacking us. Ooh, that is not... Oh, the Japanese got involved. Oh, crap, that is not good. Just go ahead and cut them all off. Cut them all off. Oh, crap, that is not good. Go up there, then. Retreat, retreat this way. 
and at least encircle them. Red shells are nice backline defenses. Defense is not always just fighting the enemy advance on the front lines. The council must be prepared for every possible scenario in the war, and extensive preparations in case of a general enemy breakthrough would be prudent. But organizing defense lines not right on the front, but further behind as far as the lines of Tuva, we can be more sure that we will never be in immediate danger of complete collapse. These fortifications will be built based on previous knowledge, combined with the experience from the first battles with Ming Jiang. While some of the high command have argued that this would mean diverting precious resources from the main front, for most it's better to be safe than sorry. This is not good at all. This is really, really very bad. Go in. Go there. Go there. Go, 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 go. Go, go somewhere. I don't care. Just get out of there. Get out of there. Love of God. Go, 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 go. We don't want to get in circle here. <laughs> okay, woo, we got there. Okay, that's good. Escape. Escape for now. That's good. That's good. Um, that's really not good, man. Hold, hold, hold. I said hold. Hold, hold, hold. This is looking not good as well. Well, let's get the peace deal going as fast as possible at this point. Oh, man, oh, man. Oh, baby. Um. I still want more attack for our guys. But there's not much we can do about that. Um, infantry, attack, more, get more defense. I want more defense. That'll be good. That'll be very good for us. Just go in there, guys. Just defend for now since we have the peace deal going anyway, so. We're going to need more fuel eventually, too. We're doing okay with this infantry down here, too. Not bad. Guys, please uh, stop attacking like that. Yeah, there you go. Kind of hang out for now. Backline defenses. If Oh, yeah. Oh, that's not terrible. Evacuate Western Mongolia. Expand conscription. Oh, that would be good to do. Let's do increased war propaganda efforts. The Council of the People's Revolutionary Council is quite obviously hesitant about taking part in the war. Even if that war is about their own survival, some still don't do everything they can to help the government survive. If we want to ensure that every citizen gives 100% of the potential to contribute to the war effort, propaganda is always a good solution. It has been tried many, many times, and has often succeeded in rallying a population. The best example we should look up to as the old Soviet Union, that despite all the military failures, used propaganda from the time it was founded until it fell to the Nazi menace. Basing ourselves on the old communist tactics, we will begin spreading posters, slogans, and more to encourage the Russians, Tuvans, and Mongolians to take part in the war. Whether they join the army, help in the factories, or just help spread the message, they will be helpful. Very, very helpful, actually. Um, is there anything else we can do here? Not really. I want more of this, though. So we can lower this a little bit more. Get, oh, well, I guess, well, that made no sense then. Oh, so if you lower this, it doesn't go down. God dang it. Well, good to know. Oh, well. Anything else here? 45%. Consumer goods? I like better consumer goods, though. Go and do that one. That's fine. Okay, are you guys actually win here? That's kind of crazy. Um, where are the helicopters? Get down here. My goal is just to fend for now. Oh, are you kidding me? How did you get in there that fast? Kill them off, then. Kill them off. You can't even kill... Oh, my God. Please, where is the ceasefire? Where the heck is that ceasefire? I thought we were supposed to get a ceasefire. Come on. Japan needs a nerf against these guys. Jesus Christ. Are you kidding me, man? Where is a ceasefire? There's nothing we can do about this, can't? Is there? No, don't go in there. Go this way. I'm going back for Curie. Screw it. Yeah, okay, the ceasefire is not in effect. What the heck? What the heck? They lied. The game is bugged or something. What the heck? There's nothing we can do about this. This is ridiculous. This is, th yeah, this is ridiculous. There's no ceasefire. There's literally no ceasefire. What? There's nothing we can do. Oh my god, are you kidding me? This is stupid. This is beyond stupid. Ask for a ceasefire? Offer a PC. Oh, yeah. This is stupid. No, it should have auto-fired. Like, honestly, like with that... If it says it's going to be a ceasefire, it should be a ceasefire. But I guess it's to focus? Are you kidding me, man? In the towns of Tuva in Western Mongolia, people will probably celebrate and wave the flag of the council before it's ensured their freedom. At least it's ensured for now. After countless skirmishes between the Red Army and enemy forces around the heavily guarded border areas, we still hold our ground. The army of Meijiang has been unable to penetrate our strong defenses, as it's slowly getting more and more exhausted by the constant struggle it has to go through merely to control its territories. Now that we've survived against all odds, without losing an inch of land, we should end this conflict. The autonomous government of Meijiang should be offered a truce by the People's Revolutionary Council, maintaining the status quo in Western Mongolia. If they are sensible, they will, be, they will see what this opportunity can bring and grab it. So stupid. Peace at last. Steps conquered? No, we should get territory from that or something. That's ridiculous. That's absolutely 100% ridiculous. You are set up to fail in this campaign. Oh my goodness. No wonder no one's 
A lot of people haven't done this mod, or not the mod, but you know, the, the nation. Holy crap, this sucks. The last to defend the Meijing Autonomous Government are the young and very, very old. Armed with the Arasaka variants as old as the government itself, these brigades have managed almost heroic resistance to the overwhelming intensity of the Red Army's advance, managing orderly retreat even as their trained counterparts have dissolved around them. Children struggle with guns almost as large as they are. Aged shepherds complain of neck aches as their packs shape at their shoulders, and yet somehow they've managed to stay organized. But as the supply lines from Manchuria and the Central Plain break down under stress and o refugees overwhelm the roads, the brigades too falter and stumble. The final con concentrated battle of the Mongolians' war is less of a battle and more of an encirclement and quick march. 3,000 brigadiers are captured in a single night as a swath of front line is destroyed by the Red Guard tactical maneuvers. Most are captured without a fight, and it becomes apparent that even the last vanguard of Mengjiang have been barely enough ammo between them to destroy a force a tenth of their size. The Central government sends vain, desperate messages to Tokyo and to Nanjing to Hissing, Amur, and Magadan in its final hours, but a bleeding heart can only muster the strength to beat on for so long as the remaining brigades fall apart and back. Minjiang accepts the inevitable. Its final organized act sends its head leadership to refuge in Beijing just before the final surrender is signed, so then a triumph, and we get nothing from it. That is... that is... Uh, this is not fun, then. <laughs> That's crap. If you don't get anything out of a war like that, after beating, literally, the co-prosperity sphere... That's crap! <laughs> I'll be honest, I'm sorry, but that's, that's not cool. That's really not cool. Uh, we can do peace, but I want to get expand conscription because we need more manpower. The days go by, and the pool of available manpower to use in the front line shrinks by a bit, with the passage of time. More and more men die in their brave fight for their Far East. Some to the protected homelands, but many simply to survive. We've already taken extensive measures to ensure that we have an adequate number of men ready to call into the battlefield, but even that seems to be not enough. Conscription must be expanded once more and to cover anyone who is able to serve for the army. Young men, who may not be even considered adults yet, shall be recruited. The older generation that might even faintly remember the events of the Civil War ha will have to be drafted as well. Even women that wish to volunteer for the good of the country will be welcomed. As the saying goes, desperate times call for desperate measures. Yeah, that is... Hmm. Oh, and... Oh, do we... We don't even get that, do we? Um... Yeah, we don't... God dang, we didn't get that. Are you kidding me? I guess we're forced to do that one because we can't do that one yet, so... Our last stand? Well, we can't do that one because we're not at war, so... But at least peace at last. The conflict with the Japanese puppet of Mengjiang has tried to call, claim Mongolia for itself. Did not prove to be the glorious war of liberation for the country that we had hoped for when it began. The soldiers of the council, from skilled and experienced officers to fresh recruits, fought bravely, often not for their motherland but to stay alive. Still, the war has ended. Now our rivals have cornered us into an even more difficult position than before, especially after crushing the dream of the Mongolian people's front. However, we must overcome these hurdles, for with what little resources are available to us, and by rallying the citizens of the council around the cause we fight for, we will soon rise again as a regional power to challenge the autocrats we are surrounded by. I hope we get something out of here, because that's crap to us. We should get something, something out of it. Like, how many other people can beat up, at least defend for at least a minute, period of time, against the, the co-prosperity sphere? Like, literally the entire co-prosperity sphere. Because Japan got involved, and these guys got involved, and even China might have gotten involved, but I don't remember. Because I've actually played as many young before. You really need the Japanese help out, but my god. Are you kidding me? Like, we, should, we have to get something. Because we're in way too weak. But look to the steps. Vasilevsky fiddled impatiently with a cigarette. He'd never make his dislike of certain people in the Politburo secret, and he certainly wasn't going to start now. Chief among these people was Tsedembal. The Mongolian had never learnt the maneuvers of, or manners appropriate to a mere civilian. Now, Tsedembal and his cronies sat across the table right in the front of a map exercise he just began to plan. Had they no sense of pro uh, propense, propriety? Stabbing the stub out of the chair, the old Russian leaned close. His hand shoveled upon the lapels of his uniform as he strained a loose collar. And what is it I can offer you? The Mongolians offered thin lips, smiles in return, saying nothing. Said Dembal drew a dossier from his suit and nodded to him. Frowning, Vasilevsky flicked through the pages, his hands shoveled ever more intensely as he reached the end of his brief document. A cold numbness settled upon his chest. The general paused to ensure what came next would fall with appropriate impact. I will not and will never sanction the independence of a Mongolian de de deviationists. I care not if you are among them. I care not if the devil himself is in your ranks. I will not approve. A start racing like the rush to Moscow never ended. He sat back. The Mongolians looked to him, faces unchanged. They've been expecting this. Send and Ball rubbed his sample, suddenly far older in appearance, and then he spoke. You have not heard of the last of us? You will have to break my people's will first. Hmm. Saying nothing. Eh, whatever. Kemerovo? Kemerovo is probably not too easy to beat. A lot of manpower, two to four divisions. We could try it, but we have no manpower. We have literally no strength for a guy, so I'm not going to even risk it. So, screw that. That's still stupid. After the oh, after the war, learn from my mistakes. Old union revenge. Oh, look at that. Road industrialization, not bad. But build up civilian industries. I kind of like this stuff. I like this. I like this side. Trinket minimum wage with low minimum wage. All right. I like this facade of development already. Radar stations or Siberian strategy, armor speed factor. 
Um, Air Cavalry, I like that a lot. Mongolian Tactics, well, we do want to go with this side, of course. Defense bonus against a country. More is better. Cavalry divisions, not bad. Army of the Steps. Let's do all Union remnants. <clears throat> we feel as one of the many who intend to continue the dream that was a Union. It's our job to continue where the old Union left off. It was in her last leader, Buharin, that the plan to build up Siberia and Mongolia was introduced. It would again support the local population, as well as grow the industrial, agricultural, and infrastructural power of their new home. We must act now to tame the step. Through programs such as industrialization and the building up of local infrastructure, we believe we can turn Western Mongolia and the Siberian plains into industrial areas. Not only will we be building up infrastructure in a place that has lacked it for so long, we'll also create a strong base for future expansion, and we'll be able to support ourselves in the event of conflict with the sensual Siberian warlords. Nice. And silence a still, small voice. Oh, hey, we got more infantry? That's nice. We could have used that earlier. The morning Dorgan rose earlier than usual. The cries of the patch had been particularly strident the previous night, and the sheep roamed ruthlessly outside poor, poor Borgen as he yapped. Perhaps they started too easily, or perhaps the movement of the previous months had kept them on a perpetual edge. Whole convoys of trucks sweeping the plains here and there, the growls filling the endless sounds. One or two of the flock had broken pasture altogether, fleeing for parts unknown, perhaps the lights at night had simply driven them mad. Dorgan had never been quite seen anything like it. The chill airs of the dawn made for good tea, and the little slice of or compressed leaves she had hacked off a tea block and the, in a bazaar in the southeast were, after a few minutes, fragrant. Their essence swirled in the air as Dorgan walked, or waited for the cup to cool, and the endless snowless, where the life itself seemed to curl thick and rich around the warm places, it was easy to lose oneself to feel one's essence fusing with an ancient rhythm that would outlast a moment. The eternal was interrupted by a series of horns, then a slow thundering as dots swarmed on the horizon. Dolgan watched masses of men, thick like forest trunks, march into view. All wore the garments and arms of soldiers, all wore the insignia of sickle and hammer, and their faces shone with excellence. Behind them, trucks and bulky, treaded wagons rolled into view, bearing only one word in Mongolian Russian, victory. Yeah, we still don't get, we didn't get anything. We didn't get anything from that war. That is BS, man. What, no war sport? No political power? Nothing? To say, hey, we stood up to the co sphere? That pisses me off, man. That's disappointing. But skirmish of the mountains. In the borderlands of Mongolia, men of the Red Army and their allies under the command of Lieutenant Leonid Morozov investigated rumors of incursions by Menjiang. The soldiers were joined by a stranger from the west, a mercenary who tipped them off about an incursion by Menjiang scouts. Leonid had been hesitant to trust the man, but the potential impact of a surprise attack from the fascists in Mongolia could not be understated. As they passed through the mountain passes into Mongolia, he could tell something was wrong. Leonid ordered his men to come to a stop. The winds had shifted, and the air was heavy with a tense air. He saw the glint of a scope a second too late. He was thrown off of his feet by the bullet piercing his side. Leonid fell to the ground his men scrambled for cover among the rocks of the pass. A hand gripped him by his uniform and pulled him behind a large boulder. It was a mercenary. The stranger bound his side and returned fire against the enemy troops pouring into the pass. D dimly, he could see his men struggling to lay down fire against their foes. A gr small group had made back to the supply truck, securing anti-take weapons and ammo. The man who had saved him barked orders to those around him, rallying his troops to a better mount the defense. Thankfully, the men, his men, had taken surprisingly few losses and had begun to slowly pushing their attackers back. Leonid glanced back at the mercenary who only only to see that he had disappeared ahead of the Red Army line. The mercenary ran into the enemy fire with the RPG slung over his shoulders. The madman leapt into the ditch before aiming his commander commandeered weapon at the mountainside above the enemy lines. With a whoosh, the warhead flew into the mountainside and exploded. The cliff face crackled and began to fall into the valley on top of the enemy. As they scrambled to the retreat from the landslide, a cheer rang out from the surviving men. Three cheers for the mad mercenary. Cool. And is there anything else here we care about? Repair raid, secure control, but that's all that stuff down here, so... Uh, concessions, we don't really care about concessions. But after this one, we'll do the road for industrialization. In its thousands of years of human settlement, the steppes and mountains of Western Mongolian have, or Western Mongolia, have not yet seen the wonders of modern industrial life. While Russia, from Moscow to Vladivostok, is rich with industry and manufacturing, Mongolia is yet to be industrialized. If we are to bring the council to greatness and bring back the stability Eurasia enjoyed under Soviet rule, we must first industrialize a step. Well, at first a daunting task, as none have yet succeeded in taming the vast plains, we know the necessity of this work will drive it to its completion. While the Mongolian people are traditionally nomadic, we know they are strong people who will adjust well to a more sedentary modern lifestyle. There will be no greater honor than bringing the Industrial Revolution to the people of Mongolia. Very nice. Mm, let's get some more of that first. Ah, there we go. Scam loot. I want people to attack us within and without. General Getman is a man of few words. He's always preferred action to talk anyway, which is why his Red Army Command is known as the quietest HQ in the Council. Instead, of they busy themselves with civilian affairs, acting as a kind of intermediary between the Red Army and the Russians who have settled in this remote part of the Union. Their work is endless and is often thankless, but is a joy, quiet joy of Getman to serve, and so his joys become the duty and pride of his command team. 
Getman is finishing his latest report on food availability and the trading communes near Kaisel as the committee approaches. His smile dims a, l a little at the sight. He enjoys talking with the Russians, but the Committee for the Preservation of All Russian Unity is a counter-argument for ever leaving his office, and their pinched faces don't help. He forces a smile nonetheless, greeting the members by name, Grigory, Matlovich, Simeon. They don't ever let him finish, because why would they? He's nothing more than a glorified paper pusher to them, and by God do they insist on pushing him today. Their topic of concern, however, is entirely new to even to the general. For the first time, the Russians ask not about the privileging of Mongolians to civilian positions in the Politburo, nor about the constant shortage of vital fuel supplies to the Russian businesses, but about the fate of the nation itself. They demand an answer to the Mongolian question. Matlovich goes so far as to call the Mongolians aliens, and they begin to inquire about the selective silence of Vales Vasilevsky. This silence, they say, is premediated. But who knows what the old general's thinking, or if he thinks of Russia at all? Propose a policy change of General Velesky? Throw them into the internal security to reconsider their words. Hmm. The fate of the nation self. Mongolian question. He goes, goes so far as to call them aliens. Propose a policy change? Eh, who cares? It doesn't really matter to me too much. Hmm. What do we want to do? Throw them into there? To the Mongolian question. Throw them into the internal security. Eh, let's not throw them in there yet. We want more plus five here. But for generals, actually for this guy. Level two attack. You're he's learning quite a bit, actually. I want this guy. This guy's so much better. This will get this is the guy I wanted for us to use early on, but we just weren't able to. You probably need to get Aggressive Assaulter. Let's be real here. Aggressive Assaulter is going to be really nice for that. And we're going to get a little more command power, so then we can some, do more stuff here. The road to industrialization. Good. As it should be. Build up civilian industry. One of the largest issues with the council is its critical lack of significant indes civilian industry. Civilian industry is at the backbone of any country, and we cannot expect to bring back the glory, all glory, of the without a strong base of factories behind us. We shall embark on a campaign to work on the creation of new centers of light and heavy industry throughout the western Mongolia, with the goal of making this previously nomadic land into a modern one. Upon the completion of these projects, moral opportunities will be open to the Council. We will be able to manufacture goods that we currently must get from a complex system of only semi-reliable trade among the former Soviet states, many of which we despise as a terrible necessity of having to do business with at all. It will be these factories that will kickstart the Council's upward spiral towards greatness for the motherland. Absolutely. Actually, can we raid anybody? Like, can anybody raid us? Probably not, actually. Uh, they're raiding each other, which it looks like what is going on. We can only get 0.94 political power every single day. And... Oh, Krasnoyarsk. How strong is this group, actually? Two to four divisions. We actually might be able to do okay here. I'm going to risk it. Because we do have nine divisions, so let's try it. Krasnoyarsk sounds nice. Hopefully we don't fail. For the love of God, please don't fail. And we didn't need some more command power, too, so that's my, kind of my fault, so... All right, we got some more stuff here. Um, how's the legacy of the Siberian plan? Consumer goods are looking really good. Minus 10% is actually really, really good. We have a little bit of manpower as well. Um, I would like more construction speed, but I do want to make sure the civilian stuff is okay as well. We do need to keep some PP here too. Uh, we have no stability anyway, so. 74%, not bad. We'll see what happens. All right, they're not, they're not grading. Swallowing our pride, Vas Vasilevsky held the paper in his hands. <clears throat> Face composed, hands still. The door in front of him was of polished oak, hiding from his view the men who had recently made a fool of him in his administration. Negotiation from a position of strength in such a situation was difficult, almost comically so, but the seasoned veteran of both the battlefield and politics of the former USSR was up for the challenge with one resolved sight. Vasilevsky opened the door. Comrade greeted the seated Jamalyanjin Levhav. The Surin, the great eminence of the Mongolian faction, one amongst a cluster of uniformed and suited Mongol communists. Comrade J answered Balas Vasilevsky, meeting the Mongols' heavy gaze with his own. I must apologize for the unfortunate series of events that have led to this meeting. I hope that we can put the past behind us. Jay's expression was less than forgiving, but Vasilevsky's continued on. My staff and I have drafted up an agreement for our two factions intended to ease tensions that includes both, both in the future Mongolia and Russia. Jay took the preferred paper, and he and his counsel began to pour over the details. Vasilevsky waited in silence until, at last, Jamil Yangjin set the paper down and said, What? We will create a new draft together, but we will appreciate your gesture. It's rubbish. Ah, who needs stability? It's rubbish. Should be paid? As I should. I'm ready to beat the crap out of all these other warlords. Failed states, man. They're all failed states, except for us. Nice. At least we're doing focuses, finally. Looking up a little bit, maybe. Have we got more PP, too? Oh, great. 
And I do want to bait people into attacking us a little bit more. I do want to bait them into attacking us, so... Um, I want to do that, but... Hmm, well, we'll be able to scan for loot soon enough anyway, so... It's fine. Alright, let's do something else here. I want to do one more thing here. Um, this stuff is okay. Some goods. Who needs stability, right? There you go. How's this looking? 2%? Not great. But then, reopen the fields. Let's do this one. Modern construction equipment. As we embark on the Industrial Crusade, we find ourselves critically unequipped in the way of modernized equipment. While we have many grand plans for the advancement of our nation's infrastructure and industry, these shall never come to fruition without the procurement of large amounts of the construction gear. Using various sources from throughout Russia and even Asia, we'll spend a considerable amount of money purchasing machines and tools. This will be used to equip our vast many construction brigades, who will embark on the great taming of the Western Mongolian steppes and mountains. While we regret these capitalistic weapons of gaining these vital tools to the programs of industrialization, we know that they will go towards a greater expansion to reach our goal of a socialist state. Great. On the workers' front? Uh, yes, probably it will get better too, which is nice. We must remember that above all else, we are still representatives of the Soviet Union and inheritors of her progressive labor practices. It would seem that in the aftermath of her downfall, some of these have slipped from our focus, with more pressing matters calling for more drastic measures. However, now that we find ourselves in a stable position once again, it is only natural and more morally necessary that we return to the promise of Marxism, a state by the workers, for the workers, of the workers. A minimum wage is to be reintroduced, worker safety prioritized, and the working man exemplified. If we were to maintain our legitimacy as a successor of the Union in the East, then it is time we begin to act like it. While some now scoff their noses at the old Union, claiming it was weak and authoritarian, but now as the rest of Russia devolves into serfdom, we must be the forces of progress, showing Russia the true glory of the Union once more. Anything else here? Alright, I'm going to keep boosting this up, because I like the, the bonuses. I would close that out too. Um, boom. Loyalty is 80%, not bad. Uh, civilian power would be nice to get, so or stability, whatever. And this one? It should go up a little bit more, and now we get 0.74, which is not great, but it is what it is. We're opening the mining fields. Yeah, I want to get through this stuff as fast as possible. Let's learn from mistakes first. While our soldiers fought the hardest for a cause and just and true, is without mentioning that we were not the best prepared, equipped, or trained for the war. The Japanese puppets and their near endless resources, their help from the best strategists in East Asia, and the support from Indonesia to the Kuro Islands meant that we were outgunned and outmatched. We were determined to not repeat the mistakes of the main Xiang War. In a series of military enhancements, we will build up our forces, establish new tactics, and find new ways to combat our enemies. Yet we're also at a crossroads. There are some who wonder whether or not, after spending so long so far out from our native Russia, if we should really turn our eyes back to Moscow or instead find the place for socialist Mong Mongolia. We will be faced with these questions as we develop the doctrine for a new decade. And scavenge for loot as well. Good. We could train our soldiers, but how bad are we looking? Artillery! We're actually looking okay on artillery. Actually, if that's the case, I want to use these guys because they're 12 combat whip. Get some artillery on them. That'll help out. Nice. We have enough for that. Good. We have enough arm XP anyways. If we throw on artillery here, that actually be quite bad because it does slow us down a little bit, I believe, right? Actually, no, it doesn't. 35? If we throw on these vehicles, it will, but... Support artillery? It hurts our organization a little bit, but that's fine. For 24... Tw oh, that's, that's so nice. Yeah, maximize that. There you go. Cool. And then we're going to go and do agriculture mechanization. The staff has been an agricultural beast through impossible to, the thought impossible to attain. What little grows there grows poorly, and what flourishes is of no use to the human palate. This is why the past peoples of the steppe have tamed the wild beasts of the land and rode de the deserted plains. Yet we know this is no food strategy for a modern world. We must now tame the steppe for the first, final time. Through the use of foreign important agricultural machines and workhorses of steel, we shall till the soil for the first time, providing the people of the council a stable source of food for the first time in their long history. The people shall get their labor to the ground, put their labor to the ground, and from it shall spring the savior of Mongolia, the bringer of food, and the rebirth of the great, great union. Oh, we can raid these guys? Arkutsk? Uh, these guys are probably not too easy. We actually have really high relations with them, but let's not do that one. Can we raid anybody else, actually? Um... Kemerovo? Yeah, we can do Kemerovo. Yeah, why not? They still have two to four divisions and a lot of manpower, but that's okay with us for now. Oh. Presidium, working concessions, no one cares again. And then reopen the mining fields. When the Union fell, so much did other infrastructure and industrial projects, the strong Moscow government had been able to prop up with the state money to provide economic potential to Tuba, a land known most of all for its lack of significant industrial potential. Now, looking over the old Soviet maps and layouts of mines, we've made plans to revitalize these abandoned mining fields and use them to provide for the Council. Using Tuban labor, these mines will provide precious resources for the Council and its armies, resources that will prove useful in an inevitable coming conflict with the enemy forces that surround us. The Tuban mines can procure useful resources from 
iron and coal to g coal and cobalt. Resources that are harder and harder to come by with less and less friendly neighbors. While it may be difficult to process, bringing these mines back up to full capacity in production, the results will surely be worth the process. Very good. Alright, let's continue doing this. some of this stuff too. Yeah. Oh, uh, no, wait, no. No, no work at concessions. No, no, no. Uh, let's increase IC. I know, let's never do that one. Let's do that one. And then... The two of a road. For centuries, the native peoples of what is now the council needed no roads but open step. The horses carrying them like ships on a grass sea, yet as the world moves forward, we see the replacement of these man beasts, a burden with pack. Horses giving way to motor powered machines, carrying resources and soldiers. As we introduce more and more of these to the council, we must make the necessary changes to the landscape through the addition of roads and other vital infrastructure. In our war, one thing we struggled with the most was the lack of infrastructure, clogging up supply roads or supply lines as dirt roads and paths disappeared or muddied up, with nothing but scant markers marking roads in some areas. Motorized units found the grass on difficult to maneuver in some times, asking clearly for better paved infrastructure. We will begin a plan to create a vast network of roads throughout our country in order to enhance our state's capabilities at war and at peace. Now we can do... Oh, come over. We could try that one. And before we get too far, I do want to make sure we do this one in time. So, let's get more infantry attack and defense. Plus 5%, plus 5%. Attack is good. Armor, don't want to care about that too much. That's good, that's good. And don't mind doing this a little bit more, but we do need a little bit more command power. But let's finish this up with reading one more focus. Radar stations, decryption machines, um... Let's do that one. The soldiers of the council may be brave, tenacious, and well-meaning, but this means nothing if they're constantly bombarded by the Japanese bombers without any warning or notice. It was far too often that the whole formations of our men were thrown into disarray by accurate and unexpected air assaults. If we're to avoid the silent death from the skies, we must create a network of defensive radar stations to give our men ample warning in order to react. Using American technology and domestic copies, we will put together a radar corps that will cooperate with these these radar stations to report back to the command the positions of enemy air groups. We expect that casualties will be significantly reduced if we could accurately predict and react to these attacks, but I hope you enjoyed this somewhat frustrating, but still somewhat fun episode. If you did, please do consider leaving a like. It does help me out. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below, and I will see you tomorrow as we will raid Crest Noyarsk and hopefully reunify Central Siberia. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.